Yeah. Yep. Cool. Hi, everyone. So welcome to the was it workshop five on um, spatial temporal dynamics in neuroimaging on models and analysis. Uh, so, yeah, we have, well, I guess, if we little background on why we did this or why we thought this would be a cool workshop to have. So, I guess, you know, traditionally, CNS has a lot of, um, you know, stuff at single neuron scale and, uh, you know, the more and more each year, it feels to us anyway, there's more and more stuff happening at sort of systems level, whole brain scale neural masses, neural fields, all this sort of stuff, networks, connectomes. Um, in particular, at these, once you go to these big scales, there's lots of uh, really cool dynamics that emerge, we think. And there's other mechanisms that you maybe don't get um, when you're looking at spikes and whatnot. So you've got large, complex systems. You know, there's lots of interesting stuff happens. Um, and especially with the massive growth in your large neuroimaging data sets like human connectome project and uh, you know, big meg data sets, EG data sets, MRI data sets. Uh, it seems like it'd be a very big growth area for computational neuroscience. So we wanted to have a mix of talks both on the modeling side and on um, how to analyze these big data sets. Uh, um, so yeah, for that we have Seven speakers. I should also say, hi, I'm James Roberts. I'm from Keanu Group of in Brisbane. And co host, co organizer is Paula Sanzalea. You can say hello. <laughs> He's also in Brisbane. Oh. <laughs> um, so, we, I mean, we originally organized this to be a workshop in Melbourne. So, we were very pleased to manage to get a whole bunch of really good speakers from all around the globe. So now that it's not in Melbourne and it's online, having people scattered across multiple continents and a lot of time zones <laughs> becomes quite tricky uh, for scheduling. So alas, for us, it's 10 p.m. now. And by the time this finishes, it will be approaching 2 a.m. So apologies in advance if we start getting somewhat tired. Um, but no excuses for the people in the Americas that we are accommodating <laughs> by having it in your morning <laughs> and Europeans are going to end the day and afternoon. Um, so yeah, we'll have seven speakers. First up will be Paula and then we have Chang Song Zhou from Hong Kong and Yu Zhang Wang from uh, Newcastle University in the UK, Tricia Orio from Chile, uh, Katarina Glom from Lausanne, Switzerland, and John Griffiths from Toronto. And then finally, perhaps inexplicably, we have Johan van der Meer from Brisbane presenting at 1 a.m. So I'm sure he'll be extra alert. Um, yes. Sure. Paula, is there anything else that we should say? We still have kind of five minutes before your scheduled start, um, or you could always start early ish to have yeah, more can, time. Or maybe give us a chance of getting a break later, maybe. Because we've got a kind of Condensed yeah. schedule. <laughs> um, we can we can wait a little bit. Um, if you if you want, like, give it a few more minutes in case. Uh, we have sixty two people. people. Uh, pretty good. Okay. That's yeah. more than we probably get in Melbourne. <laughs> pretty full indeed. Bit. Yep. So, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> Or joining. You can get your slides ready, I guess. Um, yeah, I do have them ready. Yeah, no, I yesterday not. I had a problem with these slides, so yeah, better. Yeah, I should also say, uh, so this Crowdcast, if you haven't been to many of the other sessions, there's a question uh, answering, asking system, so you can ask questions in there by text and upload them. And then uh, I will, it's probably easiest, I think, and smoothest if I read them out to the speaker, or the same speaker can read them and reply. 
Um, and if we have any excess ones, you can chat on Neurostars, which was posted in the chat and will probably be repeated periodically. Um, and we hope to have a discussion at the end if we're still awake. I think you probably start or it's close enough. Yep. No 65 problem. people. Yep. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Um, well, thank you again for joining us on this workshop. Um, and uh, thank you for joining my presentation in particular. If you watched my presentation yesterday, uh, there will be a strong overlap. So thank you if you're watching this for a second time. Though I did add a couple of uh, new bits and pieces um, based on some of the uh, questions I, I was asked yesterday. So this talk is about Neuroflows, and it's a toolbox I've been developing for um, quite a bit right now, and it's for the estimation of velocities and sparse representation of spatial temporal whole brain dynamics. <clears throat> so the outline of this talk, uh, I broke it down into three parts. Ooh. Um, I already found a type of spatial temporal brain waves. <laughs> uh, I will talk talk about a little bit about the toolbox itself, and then a couple of um, slides about the application to fMRI data and MEG data that we are working on. So, <laughs> the same type of uh, spatial temporal brain brain waves. We know from uh, neuroimaging data that neural activity exhibits constantly evolving complex spatial temporal patterns. And there is switching between these patterns, and this can explain the large scale functional reorganization we, we observe. And we call these uh, spatial te temporal patterns waves, or sometimes brain waves to qualify a little bit um, where they are coming from. And these brain waves, uh, as I said, they have been observed both in neuroimaging uh, recordings, in this case of uh, ECOG uh, grid during sleep by Mueller and colleagues in 2016. And you can see, uh, you can see here that there is a rotating uh, pattern. I hope that's not too, too jumpy. There is always a little bit of a lag uh, with the slides. And very recently, uh, James, James and colleagues, they also simulated this brain network model uh, with a structural connectome derived from diffusion imaging <clears throat> and a neural mass model. And they observed that they had these highly structured uh, patterns appearing. So we want to know how we can, um, we can uh, study them, analyze them, and make sense out of, out of them uh, in a more sparse way too. But why is it so important that we characterize these spatial temporal patterns? Well, the thinking is that if we improve our understanding of the dynamic interaction between all these brain regions at the same time, we will better understand our complex cognitive functions and how we can move from one cognitive task to another. So how do we characterize these complex spatial temporal patterns? Well, our choice uh, was to borrow tools from fluid dynamics, in particular because we wanted to 
find a way where we can understand both um, activity as a function of space and time. And that naturally leads to the physical concept of flow or velocity. So we will go with that. First, we assume that neural activity is an active fluid. And the second, uh, we also assume that we, there will be activity particles that can be tracked. So brain dynamics are now analyzed as neural flows. And we will see some of these neural flow representations. We will have some measurement points, which are represented here by these uh, black dots. And if we have two time points of this activity, we can define a velocity vector at every point of this measurement point. So every one of these vectors is a velocity vector. And it's telling us uh, in which direction and how fast the activity is going. About the activity particles. Activity particles, if we were talking about neurons, for instance, uh, an activity particle could be a spike, but in because we're assuming activity is a, a continuum, uh, these activity particles will be a wave front, for instance, or also called a wave packet. And we will track in time the trajectories traced by these activity particles, and these trajectories will be the functional path, actually, that um, emerge and dissolve over time. I always like to acknowledge other tools that uh, that use the, the same approach in two dimensions, so images which are two-dimensional and they are capturing activity that evolves over, over time as well. Similar frameworks have been used, and there are some nice toolbox, toolboxes available, uh, in particular Neuropath in MATLAB, OFAM as well, and WAVE uh, by uh, Mueller. All of these, they, they use this uh, fluid dynamics approach in which activity is mapped onto a velocity vector field, so we know direction and magnitude of propagation. And in particular, this allows us actually to detect some nice features of these velocity vector fields, which are called singularities, or in this case, uh, a type of singularity is called critical point. These critical points actually, uh, they, they're um, like a... Yeah, they are just a point, but they do capture what's going on with this velocity vector field. They do tell us a lot about these spatial, complex spatiotemporal dynamics. So our aims were uh, to provide a representation of brain function that accounts for the spatial embedding of the brain and track information flow, uh, encompassing geometrical and temporal aspects of activity, and hopefully produce a sparse representation of, of complex spatiotemporal dynamics when we have a large volume of data. So we will be working with volumetric images uh, that, uh, or yeah, and 4D images because they are three-dimensional in space and they evolve in time. So let me tell you a little bit about the toolbox, which is called, uh, unsurprisingly, Neural Flows. We are now currently working very hard to finish this paper, so you can you can know everything about it, including how we validated these methods. Uh, yesterday, I had a question about uh, how do we know that the singularities that we identify and, and, and classify really this type of singularity. So you will have that information here. You will also have some ideas about uh, running times and also about errors with respect to the spatial and temporal resolution of your data sets. So I made a pre-release yesterday exclusively for CNS. Well, now the repository is open. And today I made sure that I polished some bits. So running the examples that you will find here will be uh, much more simple. So I hope that you go and clone this and download the code and start playing around with it if you find it interesting. So <clears throat> the toolbox essentially uh, follows a, a sequential uh, workflow. The most typical workflow is we'll have some data uh, as input. This uh, data will be passed into some methods for estimating this flow, so this velocity vector fields that we have here. And after that, these velocity vector fields will be used to detect singularities and <clears throat> we will classify them. We also do some streamlined tracing, which is this, uh, as I say, functional path that uh, activity particles follow. And after that, we these singularities constitute this path representation and we will do some singularity statistics and singularity tracking over space and time. And this will already enable us to uh, quantify and classify very complex patterns that are happening at the scale of the whole brain. 
this simple workflow actually mapped into a simple architecture, modular architecture of the toolbox. In particular, is um, concentrated in this core uh, module. But of course, we need as well some input output modules to handle reading and uh, writing operations. The analysis, um, the analysis module as well that provides um, additional additional functions for you to make sense of. Uh, a lot of complex data that we're generating as well, and some visualizations, which um, these functions are the functions that I've used to produce some of the images that you will see here in this presentation. So something about the input data that you might be interested in, um, in knowing. Uh, so we have the physical system that is the rain, and, and um, we measure this. We have measuring points. And we accept for the toolbox unstructured data. So this is unstructured data and would be like um, fMRI parcelated time series, for instance, or rain network models. But we also accept the structured data in the form of voxel-based um, uh, voxel data. This, uh, this little banner that says experimental feature here is because we do have an experimental feature. This is the, the new, new information that um, allows for the estimation of flows in triangulated surfaces, which are a two-dimensional manifold embedded in three-dimensional space. And I say it's experimental, we have used it, but yeah, still still uh, a lot of work to do there and polish. So if, you, if you're interested, just contact me and, and we can work something out. Um, it, it gets tricky on triangulated surfaces, but I know there are some cool things to explore there. Configuration file, this toolbox, I, I won't lie, it it, uh, it, start, uh, it started like something small and now it has grown in complexity. And to do that, um, I decided to use a JSON file for the, for the input configuration file. In here, in this configuration file, you, you will have absolutely everything and you will tell the toolbox where your data is, where the results have to go. Um, also, whether you are using uh, the parallel computing toolbox, the toolbox is in MATLAB and actually exploits quite a bit the parallel toolbox. But don't worry if you don't have this toolbox, we do provide every function um, to, to do it sequentially. It will just, it will just take a little bit longer. <clears throat> so the flow estimation, what it produces is these uh, velocity vector fields that are evolving over, over time as well. So um, if you had a very simple, for instance, traveling wave, this uh, flow representation wouldn't change. It would be probably pointing in one single and very coherent direction. But yeah, uh, the spatial temporal derivatives of uh, brain activity are not a constant, really. <clears throat> to simplify the analysis, we can look, for instance, at different snapshots of these flows. and calculate these functional trajectories or streamlines. And these streamlines, it's essentially a visual representation uh, uh, to assist us to understand what's going on. So we can detect regions of space where activity is going really fast and activities of, uh, or regions of space where activity is going quite slowly, it's not moving. And some really, uh, what I find really um, interesting is these regions of space that constitute saddle regions, so there is a saddle point here where if we were following an activity particle that comes over here, it will be diverted to another direction. And these are three snapshots. Uh, it's the same two-dimensional slice, but the time frames are non-contiguous. Um, so that's why they look um, quite different. We provide two methods, the horn shank, because it's simple to implement, simple to understand, and we wanted to lower the barriers um, between implementation theory, so if you are going to go and look at the code, it, I hope uh, it's easy to understand when you look also at the, at the equations of, the, of this method. We also implemented a phase gradient, so if you're interested in using, um, <clears throat> if, you are, you, um, if you're using the instantaneous phase of your data, you can also um, try a different method, for instance. So flow decomposition. We implemented some singular value decomposition. This was inspired by something that Rory Townsend did in Neuropath in a Toolbox. And the idea is that because the flows are also complex, we can actually obtain the, the components of these flows that constitute 
the, the most predominant patterns that we are going to see. And in this example, which is an example that you have in the toolbox and you can run, we will see that the, the, the most representative mode is one of a rotating wave, wave where it has the center of rotation on the right hemisphere here. And the second most uh, common mode is the a traveling wave that, where the activity is going from the right hemisphere toward the left. And then modes that represent the less, they also have um, uh, more diversity in, in terms of where the vectors are pointing through. <clears throat> These velocity vector fields, when we calculate the norm, essentially we obtain the speed. And this is essentially transmission, conduction, or propagation speed of waves. And I realized that um, I have six minutes, so I will try to uh, go through these slides. We provide the singularity tracking, which is the spatial representation. And this is the uh, singularity tracking of this rotating wave. We can see th this is the x-axis, and this is essentially the, the right hemisphere here. What you are seeing are the singularities, and it's the center of rotation of that large-scale rotating wave. It moves, and the singularities do change stability as well, and that's why we have uh, it's not a unique pattern, but it's a bit more complex if we look at this, um, if we were just looking at the amplitudes, for instance. And all these little dots, different colors, correspond, correspond to one of these different uh, singularities or critical points. And we have eight different critical points in three dimensions, including <clears throat> sources, so the activity is going out from this point, sinks, the, the activity goes into these points, spiral sources and spiral sinks. And then we have these beautiful saddle points as well, where um, activity is going <clears throat> into the saddle point, but is diverted into the other two orthogonal axes or vice versa. We provide some singularity statistics as well. Um, so you can track this with respect to your regions of interest and with respect to time. And um, you can see as well which nodes actually are the most active in terms of becoming these kind of anchor points or, um, or yeah, or structural equilibria of of the brain. <clears throat> Here you have a zoom representation, zoom version of this uh, picture. So our application to fMRI, um, I, yeah, we also started analyzing some fMRI data, and we can see some waves. This is a movie watching data set and you will see waves propagating toward the back at some point. The waves are very complex and it's expected of movie watching because we're engaging different sensory modalities as well. And we have the representation of the streamlines as well. These um, two sets of videos are not um, synchronized, unfortunately. I was trying to make one for today, but I. I was trying to polish the toolbox for you, <laughs> if you're interested in using it. So we can see these streamlines that, uh, which are functional pathways as well, that are forming and dissolving. It looks like a little bit of um, a hairy, a hairy representation of, of the brain. But we do have these functional bundles, and they do indicate where activity is converging and from where it's coming as well. So we can trace some, um, we can set some tracer particles so we can understand better where the activity um, emerges and where it will end up. And sometimes you have reverberating patterns where the activity is not going anywhere but it's just going in circles. We perform the mode decomposition as well, and in this case, we had at least 10 or 12 modes that are representative of these uh, dynamics. And the singularities that I say for you might not make a lot of sense, but these are important. And here is <clears throat> here are some thoughts about these singularities, in particular to the density of saddle points that we have. And why are these so important? What about them and what? why are they so special? Well, there is, there is some uh, theory at the moment or well, spatial temporal patterns are metastable. Uh, there is a line of thinking about this metastability and what it represents for the brain and our uh, functional organization. Uh, 
Metastability is key to the spontaneous reorganization of range function. This is a recent paper by uh, Sagami and Friston. And it relates to uh, a previous concept that Friston explored as well on self-organizing instability. Uh, that perception has an in inherent tendency to produce dynamical stabilities that enable the brain to respond sens sensitively to different sensory perturbations. So we do need these unstable points to be able to react and um, for our, our brain to reorganize. And so this metastability or self-organizing stability is achieved by visiting these unstable fixed points, which are subtle. So these are some ideas. Uh, there are some controversial points here to discuss, but now we have found a, a way to identify these subtle points in the brain and track them across space and across time. So we are also doing some work on MEG, but I will leave that uh, um, for later. And it's uh, James Punk who is leading this um, study. So with that, I will stop here. I will thank you uh, to James and Leonardo and Stuart for um, collaborating with me, guiding me and finding bugs. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, so we have a tiny bit of time for some questions. Yeah, I want over time, one minute, I think. <laughs> uh, so John Griffiths has a question. Do the contours in the flow fields follow the anatomical functional boundaries, for example, lobes, regions, white matter, CSF borders, etc.? And also, do they flow up and down anatomical functional hierarchies or structural pathways? Do they uh, lobes, regions? Hmm. That's a really uh, good question that we um, haven't um, fully uh, studied yet, but we will. Actually, that's one of the ideas um, we are exploring with uh, uh, Pier Paolo Sorrentino. And uh, we presented a poster yesterday where we want to uh, see how correlated these functional pathways, so these contours in the flow field, follow direct anatomical connections defined by the connectome. Uh, but remains to be seen. Uh, we think they do, actually. They, they, are, con they are quite constrained by, by the connectome. Yep. Uh, could the toolbox, Katarina asks, could the toolbox be used to find parcels like group of voxels or dipole locations that flow together? Uh, yeah, I guess I guess you could actually. You could use the the. I I haven't thought about that, so that's a, a very nice question. But you can actually find which vectors are going in exactly the same direction. You you have that information, so potentially yes. Cool. And we're squeezing one more quick one, I guess. Yeah. Uh, John already had one, so not that one. And this one has more votes. So could it be possible to use this toolbox with electrophysiological data? Um, well, as it currently is, probably not, because it does. Uh, well, unless you, if your electrophysiological data is three dimensional, so in, in space, and then you also have the fourth dimension of time, then yes. If it's two-dimensional sequences, probably not. And I would recommend that you see one of the toolboxes I mentioned earlier for, for this type of data. Uh, and they have been tested ex exactly for this type of data. Yeah, Neuropath would be good for that. Neuropath, right? yeah, Neuropath, yeah. It's one of the pooling is what is it? <laughs> uh, OK, sorry to the other questions, John and James, but we probably do have to move on. So. Thanks, Paula, again. And you can ask those questions on your stars, yep. I yep. guess. We'll yep. them. Uh, so then the next speaker is Chang Song, or to invite to the stage. Bye. And say bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs>